special about a football Saturday in Knoxville. The colors and the sounds. The electricity that runs through the 96,000 fans that jam Neyland Stadium every time the volunteers in their orange shirts take the field. In 1983, expectations were high for the Tennessee Volunteers. They always are for a program that has been a consistent top 10 team for over a decade. There was reason for optimism. Philip Fulmer was beginning his first year as Tennessee's head coach. A former player and longtime assistant coach in Tennessee, Fulmer knew the expectations are always high. He would accept nothing else. There was good reason for optimism and enthusiasm this season. On offense, the collection of talent was impressive. Heisman Trophy candidate Keith Schuler returned for his junior season. He was ready to shatter all of Tennessee's passing marks. Seniors Corey Fleming and Craig Faulkner were the veterans on a deep and talented receiving core. The running backs experienced, led by Charlie Garner, James Littleman Stewart, and Aaron Hayden. The line was anchored by Bubba Miller and Jeff Smith. There were untested spots on the offensive line, but there was plenty of talent. But the concern was on defense. Linebackers Ben Talley and Reggie Ingram were all-star candidates. But there was a young secondary and a defensive line that had promise, but not much experience, game after game, through the rugged Southeastern Conference schedule. When the opener finally came around on September the 4th, Tennessee players were glad to get the new season started. Fans were ready to see just how good this first year edition of Fulmer's Volunteers would be. When Louisiana Tech came to Neyland Stadium, the stage was set for a big orange explosion. Where the Volunteers were tearing up the turf in more ways than one. I think basically the highlight of the year is just the, the atmosphere that's been created on the team and, and the emotion that this team has played with. Uh, you know, the fun that we're having out there on the field, I think it's been a big highlight. Just, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's the most fun I've had around here since I've been here, and it, it, it makes football, you know, that just a whole lot more enjoyable. And, and uh, you know, I enjoy going out there on Saturdays and even during the week in practice, which is kind of unusual for me. You know, I kind of enjoy practice sometimes. The Philip Fulmer era began on September the 4th when Louisiana Tech came to Neyland Stadium. The Volunteers had a healthy respect for the Bulldogs. In 1982, Louisiana Tech played three SEC teams, losing to eventual national champion Alabama by only 13 to nothing. The Volunteers knew it was time to put the game faces on. On this brilliant Neyland Stadium night, the Bulldogs were completely outmanned and overwhelmed by Heath Schuler and the Tennessee attack. From the start, the Volunteers were on their game, and they struck quickly in the first quarter. Tennessee opened up the game in the second quarter, scoring 24 unanswered points. Here's the third down and eight. Back to throw Schuler, looking across the middle into the end zone. The pass will be touchdown. They got it. The pass complete to Corey Fleming. He crashes into the three, to the two, to the one. What else? Touchdown. They got it. On fourth down and goal. The kick by Bexport is in the air. The kick by Bexport is. Good. And here, this will be Schuler. Handoff, fullback, up the middle. What does he do? He scores for the big arm. Tennessee led 36 to nothing at halftime while holding Louisiana Tech to minus five yards rushing in the first stanza and 11 yards total offense. Tennessee concluded the scoring in the third quarter with two touchdowns. Schuler struck on a 58-yard scoring strike to Craig Faulkner. The senior from Richmond, Kentucky, had thought his career was over in the spring because of a wrist injury. But the doctors gave him the okay to play in the summer, and scoring two touchdowns on opening night was quite a thrill. 
the guy shot up, the strong safety shot up, and uh, you know I just split the seam there, and I, you know I was wondering if Heath was going to see me because we had we had a X curl on, and that was emphasizing you know the X route over there, and uh, I was just I was just hoping he'd see me. My eyes lit up, and uh, it's just like last year, a couple times he hit me on it, and uh, he, he, sure, he sure enough, he, you know the ball was there. Tennessee's final touchdown was engineered by Jerry Colquitt. Tennessee leading 43 nothing. Second and goal at the five. Stewart, the standing tailback. This is he, faked by Colquitt, coming to the near side, could run it in, will throw instead, give him six. Who made that touchdown catch? Benji Schuler. <laughs> Tennessee won the game 50 to nothing over Louisiana Tech. The offense rolled up 526 yards, and the defense pitched a shutout against the Bulldogs. It was a brilliant way to start. The 93 season was off and running, and the fans couldn't be happier. And Philip Fulmer also knew this team could be something special. Overall, I think that we have the most outstanding offensive staff that anybody can put together. We have a tremendous group of guys that have a lot of imagination. They're very hard workers, both on the field and in the meeting rooms and in recruiting. They're guys that are willing to work together and argue and hash and get to a point where when we make a decision, that's the way we're going to go with it. I also think that it's a group of people that are able to, in a very unique way, use the abilities of what's given them. We've been able to change here in 1989. We had the great tailbacks and the great offensive line and a young, youthful quarterback. We were able to change and become a running football team. 90, we were more balanced. 91, we took it the other way. We used the abilities of Andy Kelly and Carl Pickens and spread the field and did lots of things. 1992, we're back to a youthful quarterback with some talent, won a lot of football games. In 1993, our obvious strength is in Heath Schuler, and we've used his abilities to the maximum, and I think it's a great reward, uh, the accomplishments that he's been able to him to, to come to him personally, but also it's a great compliment to our staff. Our defensive staff is, is a group of very tenacious people that are interested in success and bottom line success. Uh, statistics are not that important to them from the standpoint on a day-to-day -day basis where we rank in the conference and whatever. I think they have done a tremendous job of putting a very youthful group together and achieving success. Four shutouts in this day and time in a single season is an outstanding achievement against anybody. And our, our staff has had a, had a group that basically they put the offense or the defensive line together. Initially, we've made some changes and adjustment in our linebacker play and asked them to do more things. And the whole time waiting for a very youthful secondary to get better. Uh, we had to move a couple of guys from the offense. So we had three true freshmen that are in the, in the two deep in the secondary. And as they progressed, our defense continued to progress. And uh, again, I think that's, that's a great compliment to, to be able to improve during, throughout the course of the season. And a number of occasions had to overcome several injury problems. And we've created some depth. We've played a lot of people, which is exciting for now. And it's also very exciting for the future. Tennessee's next game was at home against the Georgia Bulldogs. And everybody was sky high for this one. It was a spectacular fall night in Knoxville. A national TV audience on ESPN was tuned in to watch a revved up Tennessee defense go after one of the best of the SEC's quarterbacks, Eric Zier. Tennessee got pressure on the veteran quarterback early and often. Zier looks it over. Zier off play action, back to throw. Bang! He is sacked! Tennessee then mixing the plays beautifully, marched down the field with Heath Schuler throwing five straight completions and Charlie Garner doing the work on the ground, Tennessee moved the ball to the Georgia 21. It was third and seven. I'm not sure. Back to throw Schuler. Set up a screen. Pulled down by Fleming 20. Fleming 15. Fleming 10. Fleming 5. 4. 3. 2. 1. 6. Touchdown, Tennessee! The drive covered 71 yards in 10 plays, and Tennessee had a 7-0 first quarter lead. The Volunteers came into the game respecting the abilities of Georgia quarterback Eric Zier. The junior entered the game holding virtually all of the Georgia passing marks. He had Georgia on the move after a completion to Shannon Mitchell went for 12 yards and then a 13-yard screen pass to Bryce Hunter. The Bulldogs had moved the ball to their own 46 with the thoughts of tying the game. Zier back to throw again, being pursued, steps out, penalty marker down, long pass downfield is intercepted, intercepted. 
The first quarter ended with the score, Tennessee 7, Georgia nothing. The second quarter opened with Georgia on the move once more. Running and passing effectively, the Bulldogs had moved to the Tennessee 17. James Wilson pushed Georgia back by sacking Zaire for a six-yard loss. Georgia had to settle for the field goal. The Bulldogs, though, had cut Tennessee's lead to 7-3. The Volunteers failed to move the ball on their next possession and had to punt the ball back to Georgia. The Bulldogs got it at their own 46, and it didn't take Zaire long to get Georgia back into scoring position. This time, Georgia attacked Tennessee on the ground with a hard running of Terrell Davis. Georgia had the ball at the UT9 with a first and goal. There, Tennessee's defense stiffened. Victor Brown led the Tennessee charge. Now it was third and goal, and Tennessee made yet another big play. Zaire looking down into the end zone. The pass is incomplete. Intended for the aforementioned Thomas. It was the defender for Tennessee, Deron Jenkins, who was right Bill Anderson in his face. For the second time in the quarter, Tennessee forced Georgia to settle for a field goal. It was an emotional lift for Tennessee's defense. It was still Tennessee leading 7-6 to six with eight minutes to go on the first half. Neither team could move the ball in their next possessions. Tennessee got the ball back at its own 44 with four minutes and 40 seconds left to go on the half. Tennessee's offense finally got untracked. Schuler hit Craig Faulkner for 14 yards over the middle to get the ball into Georgia territory. Then Schuler hit tight end David Horn and the Volunteers had moved to the Georgia 9. Schuler tried to get the ball into the end zone himself, but Tennessee still maintained possession after the fumble. On the next play, from the Georgia 2, Tennessee added to the lead. He turns, he fights, he struggles, he spins, he battles. With 1.46 to go on the half, the Volunteers jumped out in front of Georgia 14-6. There wasn't much time left in the first half, but Tennessee's defense went right after Zaire. Tennessee got it back with 49 seconds left to go. And from a Georgia standpoint, that was much, too much time left for Heath Schuler and company. Tennessee, from its own 40, gave it to Charlie Garner, who went for 21. Schuler then threw to Corey Fleming for 31, and Tennessee was at the Georgia 39. On the third play of the drive, Schuler looked for Corey Fleming. Give him six. Touchdown, Fleming! The scoring drive took only 20 seconds and covered 60 yards. Tennessee exploded for 14 points in the final four minutes of the half and led 21 to six at halftime. To start the second half, more bad news for Georgia coach Ray Goff. Tennessee received the second half kickoff and the Volunteers offense now was whirring at full speed. It is Stewart, through the left side, runs through one tackle, runs through two tackles, runs through three tackles, runs over the goal line. Give him six with a great effort. Touchdown, James Stewart. With five minutes to go in the third quarter, Jerry Colquitt came on as Tennessee's quarterback, and the offense didn't slow down one bit. Aaron Hayden's running spearheaded this drive. Hayden carried four times for 23 yards, moving the ball to the Georgia four-yard line. And Jerry Colquitt did the honors for the score. Tennessee left Neyland Stadium winning over Georgia 38-6. The Volunteers were feeling very good about themselves. And the rest of the SEC and the nation found out about Tennessee's offense and a defense that was underappreciated but kept Georgia out of the end zone.
I think the Georgia game was a tremendous tempo setter for our football team and, and one a group that you would expect to set the tempo. The defensive line certainly did great in that football game. Uh, it was kind of Heath Shuler's coming out party and he was a tremendous success coming out into the 1993 season, so to speak. And our entire football team played well. We put a complete football game together. I, I, anytime you can win handedly against a Southeastern Conference opponent, it, you, you take it and you run with it. You love it. Uh, our team, I think that set a tempo for our entire season. Tennessee played its first two games in the friendly surroundings of Neyland Stadium. The third week of the season found Tennessee in Gainesville, the Swamp, one of the toughest places in the nation for a visiting team. But the ball faithful who couldn't make the journey to Florida were there in spirit back home. Tennessee was on the verge of drowning in the swamp. Jeweler regrouped the Volunteers' offense. For the first time all day, Tennessee finally began to move the football, taking it from its own 22. Tennessee moved into position to hurt the Florida Gators on the first of many big plays on this day. It took Tennessee only a minute 44 on the drive to get on the board. There was finally some life on the Tennessee sideline. The burden then fell on the Tennessee defense to get the ball back. Werfel misfired on three straight passes, and Tennessee did get it back with 1.42 left to go on the first half, still trailing 21-7. The Volunteers were 80 yards from the Florida goal line. Schuler used the two-minute drill to perfection. Getting the ball into Florida territory, it took one remarkable play to get the ball into the end zone. It was Billy Williams' first career score at Tennessee. The Volunteers had rallied for 14 unanswered points. They had turned the potential blowout into a ball game. Florida led only at halftime, 21 to 14. Just like that, 16 seconds into the second half, Florida had snatched the momentum away from Tennessee, but more importantly, had built its lead to 28 to 14. But Heath Schuler would not allow the Volunteers to fold. Like lightning, Tennessee scored in just two plays. 3.28 left in the third quarter, and Tennessee trailed 31 to 20. Tennessee's defense had been pushed all over Florida Field for most of the day. But now the Volunteers stiffened and gave Tennessee a chance to get the ball back. Ronald Davis intercepted this Werfel pass, but then he fumbled it. But Nick Gesture was there to recover, and Tennessee got the ball at the Gator 28. Again, Schuler looked for the speedster from Alcoa. And the Volunteers now were down 38 to 26, knowing it would still take two touchdowns to win it. But still plenty of time left. 7.28 left to go in the fourth quarter. A key in the game, Tennessee's defense kept Florida out of the end zone and didn't allow the Gators to run much time off the clock. The Gators did kick a field goal, but they only used one minute and 38 seconds. The Gators led it 41-26, but still three minutes left. On the ensuing kickoff, Billy Williams, who had already caught three touchdown passes in the game, came up with yet another big play. He returned the kickoff 43 yards to the Tennessee 49. Schuler was now at his best. He zipped four straight completions, and he didn't use much time off the clock. A key pass, 23 yards to Mose Phillips, put the ball at the five-yard line. With the rain now pounding down in the swamp, Schuler was able to pick out Joey Kent in the back of the end zone through the raindrops. Tennessee trailed 41-32, and the decision now was easy on the extra point. Tennessee went for two. Charlie Garner took it in for the score, and Florida's lead was now down to seven. Still, 146 to go on the game. To win, Tennessee needed the ball back. The Volunteers went for the onside kick, 
but the Gators recovered and then ran the clock out. Tennessee had gone down fighting. After being down 21 to nothing in the first quarter, the Volunteers had rallied and played well enough to win. Well, the loss at Florida basically came about because we, we played extremely hard. We did not play particularly well. Anytime you turn the ball over several times, which we did, and it was a very hostile environment, but the, the, the key element to, to remember from the Florida loss is the tremendous effort and tenacity that our football team went about the game. We actually got better as the game went on, and, and it was almost, I looked at it from the standpoint, we didn't lose the football game, we just ran out of time. Game four of the season found the Volunteers back in Neyland Stadium. 96,000 fans on hand for this SEC encounter with the LSU Tigers. Known as a passing team, LSU came out and attacked Tennessee on the ground. With Jay Johnson doing most of the damage, the Tigers moved quickly into scoring position. The Tigers had a first and goal at the Tennessee 8. However, the Tigers missed fire on a couple of passes and had several penalties that forced them to settle for a field goal. An impressive start, though, for LSU, as the Tigers led early 3-0. LSU held the ball for over three minutes on that opening drive. Tennessee got its hands on the football and moved right down the field themselves. A key play on the drive, a third and ten. Heath Schuler kept the ball and raced 18 yards for the first down to keep the drive alive. A pass to Billy Williams went for 14 yards, and Tennessee had a first down at the LSU 30. From there, Charlie Garner and James Lilliman Stewart did the work as Tennessee grabbed the lead. Going to go to the left side and with the ball it will be Stewart battling, twisting, hanging. He has scored for Tennessee. Tennessee scored on a 12-play drive and led 7-3 at the end of the first quarter. The second quarter opened with Jamie Howard and the Tigers moving into Tennessee territory. Again, the LSU running attack was effective, but Tennessee toughened and Andre LaFleur booted a 47-yard field goal. That pulled LSU to within one at 7-6. After an exchange of punts, Tennessee got the ball back at the LSU 44, and it didn't take them long to expand the lead. Schuler to Craig Faulkner for 14, put the ball at the LSU 30. Aaron Hayden then rambled for 22, down to the LSU 8. And Schuler called on Aaron Hayden one more time. And this will be Schuler handing off the Hayden. Starts right, cuts left. Five, four, three, two, one. Give him six. Aaron Hayden, touchdown, big on it. Quick and efficient. Three plays in 33 seconds, and Tennessee led it 14 to six. In practice, Tennessee had concentrated on forcing turnovers. And on LSU's next possession, the defense got the ball back. Loose ball, scrambling for it, still bounding around. Tennessee, I think, has recovered the ball. Give it to the Big Orange. Tennessee took over at its own 22 and went to work on the ground again. Coming into the season, Tennessee had the luxury of having three experienced and all SEC caliber tailbacks. Coach Fulmer acknowledged each had his own unique and different talents. On this drive, Aaron Hayden carried six times, getting the ball to the LSU six. On third and goal, Tennessee went away from the run and back to the pass. Seeing a shotgun flooding the left side. Will LSU blitz? No. Back to throw Schuler across the middle pass. Give him six. Touchdown, Corey Fleming. Ten plays and 78 yards for the score, and Tennessee had built its lead at halftime to 21 to six. Tennessee delivered the knockout punch early to LSU in the second half. After the opening kickoff, Schuler hit Billy Williams for nine yards. Came back to Charlie Garner for four yards. The next play, Craig Faulkner went for 18 yards and a first down at the LSU 40. Then back to the run. Charlie Garner scampered 29 yards to the LSU 11. The drive began and ended with Billy Williams. First down, 10 Tennessee at the LSU 11, leading 21 to 6. Schuler on the option, rolling left. Wants to pitch into the end zone. Touchdown, Tennessee. William Williams on the catch. It took less than two minutes and only five plays. Tennessee led 28 to 6, and the Tigers were on the ropes. LSU touched the ball for the first time in the second half, but couldn't do anything with it. 
Ben Talley sacked Jamie Howard on the first play for a loss of 14. Horace Morris stuffed a running attempt, and another Jamie Howard pass misfired. Three plays and out for the Tennessee defense. That gave Heath Schuler a chance to one more time stun the Tigers. LSU feigning the blitz, will they come? Low snap, here's the pass down into the end zone. Tennessee led 35 to 6 at the end of three quarters. To begin the fourth quarter, Jerry Colquitt directed Tennessee on one of its longest scoring drives of the season. James Littleman Stewart carried the ball four straight times to start things. Colquitt was razor sharp in the drive. He hit six out of six passes, putting Tennessee in position to score again. The sixth pass went for the score. Tennessee led 42 to 6 and the huge throng at Neyland Stadium was headed for home happy. LSU did score a couple of late touchdowns, but the Volunteers rolled to a 42-20 win. Tennessee ended the month of September 3-1. Tennessee's next challenge, the Duke Blue Devils from the ACC. It was homecoming on the hill, and over 96,000 fans came to see if the Volunteers would stay in full gear. Duke won the opening coin toss and elected to receive. They were trying to keep the ball away from Heath Schuler, But a great play by Ben Talley for his six-yard loss on the screenplay, and then a sack by James Wilson stopped Duke's first drive cold. The Blue Devils punted, and Tennessee made its first big play of the game. 38 yards for punt. Gets it away, wobbly spirals. Sean Summers at the 48-yard line. Looks for a block to the far side, doesn't get one. Breaks through one tackle, now gets to the corner. He's at the 45, 40, 35, 30. 25 and he is up in it and tripped as he falls down at the 17 yard line. Schuler got the ball at the Duke 17 and didn't waste time getting on the board. Again, Tennessee's defense stopped Duke and the Blue Doubles had to punt. This time, Garner and Stewart did all the work. Tennessee's tailbacks pounded at the Duke defense. The big play in the drive, Garner broke loose for 54 yards. Garner capped off the drive with his two-yard run for the score. Six plays, 80 yards, all on the ground, and Tennessee led 14 to nothing. But there was still lots of work to do. 39 and 52 have been the two Mike linebackers in warm-up. 58, 38 dress. The Mike was weak that time. Yeah. Okay, you yeah. knew that. Yeah, Got to be able to communicate. Right. The Mike was weak. Bubba knew it. Bubba knew a lot about the game on this day. You can usually just tell how well a team's going to do by how well the line's blocking and uh, that's something we've been able to do consistently this season. The Blue Devils brought one of the nation's best passers into the game. Spence Fisher had the Blue Devils moving on their next possession. Fisher hit Steve Spurrier with his 13-yard pass. Duke had moved into Tennessee's territory. But the Volunteers' defense stopped the attack. Ben Talley with a big play. Shane Burton made another good play to stop Duke on a fourth and two. Tennessee took over at its own 48, and Schuler went to the air, this time to Craig Faulkner for 23. Three running plays put Tennessee in position to score again. Tennessee had scored three touchdowns in less than five minutes and led 21 to nothing. Tennessee had run 12 plays from scrimmage, and they had scored three touchdowns in the first quarter and led it 21 to nothing. In the second quarter, again, Duke had little success against UT's defense. Ben Talley, another big play, and Duke was forced to punt. The Volunteers had scored on three of their first four possessions. This time, Tennessee moved quickly, getting the ball at the Duke 43. Six plays later, Tennessee put the ball in the end zone. Schuler to Corey Fleming, the senior from Nashville. Tennessee led it 28 to nothing. Schuler in the first half was 8 of 9 for 111 yards and three touchdowns. Duke, though, came back to make things interesting, at least. On the ensuing kickoff, the Blue Devils got on the board. 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Couldn't go all the way, and he's going to. To the 45, to the 50. Tennessee led the game 28 to 6 when the Blue Devils missed the extra point. Jerry Colquitt came on to replace Heath Schuler and he directed the Tennessee offense down the field again. Mose Phillips keyed the drive with his 19-yard run. It was capped off 
with a 25-yard field goal by John Bexport. Tennessee led it 31-6. On Duke's next possession, Tennessee's defense jumped into the scoring column. Hot clock rolling downfield. Tennessee can carry it into the end zone if they end up with the ball. Who's got it? There's a struggle for a loose ball. Give somebody six. Touchdown, Tennessee. Tennessee led Duke 38 to 6 at halftime. It looks like Green Bay tried home time. I'm thinking about the onside kick. They got it. Duke used an onside kick to start the second half and got the ball. Tennessee, though, stopped the drive when Deron Jenkins picked off this Fisher pass. Tennessee had the ball at its own 14 yard line. And again, Schuler was right on target. He completed five straight passes in another long but quick drive. He capped off the drive with a big play to a big play receiver. Right and five, Schuler again to throw, sets up the screen. It is complete across the middle. Willie Williams has the ball at the 45 to the 40, to the 35 to the 30, no way. No way. 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Big Orange. Seven plays and 86 yards in three minutes and 10 seconds. Tennessee led 45 to 6. The Volunteers won the game 52 to 19. Everybody had a chance to play and contribute. Tennessee was back on the road the following week, traveling to Little Rock to face Danny Ford's Arkansas Razorbacks. It was Tennessee's first trip to Little Rock since 1907. The Volunteers had vivid memories of the 1992 game with Arkansas in Knoxville when the Razorbacks stunned the Volunteers at Neyland Stadium. Tennessee determined this day it would not happen a second straight year. The first quarter ended scoreless. The second quarter opened with Tennessee on the move. The key play, a 32-yard completion to Craig Faulkner. It moved the ball to the Arkansas 21. Charlie Garner carried the ball to the five on this 16-yard scamper. Mose Phillips then cracked it down to the one. And from there, Heath Schuler was able to score, capping an 80-yard drive in nine plays. And Tennessee led it 7-0. The Razorbacks mounted a drive when they got the ball back, led by sophomore quarterback Barry Lenny Jr. and the running of Oscar Gray. The Razorbacks were able to use power of football, combined with pinpoint passing from Lenny to keep the ball and move it down the field. A 17-yard pass to Tracy Caldwell on a third and 14, put the ball at the Tennessee five. Lenny got the touchdown when he hit tight end Kirk Butkin on the six-yard strike. The Razorbacks had tied the game on an impressive 80-yard drive. The game was tied at 7-7. The Volunteers struck quickly on their next possession. Schuler hit Corey Fleming on a 27-yard strike to get the ball to the 46. And then Schuler and Faulkner turned in a remarkable play. The pass set up a one-yard run by James Littleman Stewart and the Volunteers had taken the lead back, 14 to seven, and that was the score at halftime. Schuler in the first half, seven of eight, passing for 160 yards. Tennessee took the opening second half kickoff, but was forced to punt. Tom Hutton backed the Razorbacks up with this 39-yard punt down at the eight-yard line. Then Tennessee's defense turned in another big play. The Volunteers got the ball back, and Schuler went right to work on the first play. Tennessee took the lead 21-7, thanks to Schuler and Faulkner and the Tennessee defense. But the Razorbacks didn't give up. On the contrary, they came roaring down the field against Tennessee. Dexter Herbert carried the load for the Razorbacks. 13 plays, 11 of those on the ground as the Razorbacks drove 74 yards. Herbert scored as the Razorbacks pulled close again, 21-14, midway through the third quarter. 
The people in red wearing the hog hats were ripe and ready for a second straight upset win over Tennessee. But to begin the fourth quarter, the Volunteers put together their most impressive drive of the year. Tennessee's trio of running backs, James Stewart, Charlie Garner, and Mose Phillips, pounded at the Arkansas front. Tennessee's young but ever-improving offensive line took control of the game. All-SEC candidate Bubba Miller anchored the Tennessee front. The sophomore from Franklin was improving with every game. So was the offense. Guard Kevin Mays and Jeff Smith, along with tackles Leslie Ratliff and Jason Lehman. They dominated Arkansas on this possession. 84 yards, 14 plays. It took six minutes and 40 seconds off the clock capped by another outstanding effort by Heath Schuler. I tell you what, guys, <laughs> fabulous job. Great football game. Coach's great plan. Everything's well done. Kicking the whole nine yards. I want to tell you what. I want to say thank you because you bailed me out for not kicking that field goal down there when we hit it close. Bama week, serious. Anytime it's the third Saturday in October, it's serious at Tennessee. But this year a bit different. Tennessee treated Alabama just like the next opponent on the schedule. Practice took a more relaxed view as the Alabama game came close. The emotions of the third Saturday in October unfolded this year at Legion Field in Birmingham. It was a perfect day for football. The defending champion, Alabama Crimson Tide, brought a 28-game winning streak into the game. A more frustrating stat for Tennessee, the Tide owned an eight-game winning streak over the Volunteers. Tennessee determined to end the streak this day against their arch rival. A lot of people around want to talk about history. You know, history doesn't really matter. It's what you do now that counts. The opportunity that you have now. If you want to hang on to history for a few minutes, I can give you a little bit of history. 1967, an undefeated long streak by Alabama was suddenly interrupted by a fine Tennessee football team right here in this stadium, the stadium coming out of this dressing room. 1985 on the way to the championship. Lots of other games in between that, by the way, over the Tennessee one. 1985 came to this dressing room right out here on this field. Dale Jones took the ball into the game for the win, intercepted it for, to secure the win. Very close, hard-fought football game, as this one will probably be. There's a whole bunch of history involved in this. And you've got a chance to be a part of it. After 60 minutes of football, a couple, three, two and a half hours, it's actually been out there. 60 minutes of football, and after four quarters, this game is history. That's not very much time in your life. That's not very much time to go out there and lay it on the line and give them everything you got. Earn your respect. We've talked a lot about the roots. We've talked a lot about the emotion. Lots of good things can happen if you want to go out there and make them happen. If you really and truly believe in these things, and if you believe in the man sitting next to you, and you're going to draw the strength from him, and you're going to be like warriors on a mission, you're able to do anything in the world, guys. Anything in the world. Unstoppable. Pride, determination, courage, things that's in your gut from way back in Little League and high school and now college football. Playing a good opponent. They put your pants on the same way you did. They were chin strap butt the same way you did. So you guys think we got plenty on offense and plenty on defense to wear them out. And I'm going to be highly disappointed when we watch that film, regardless of the outcome, if we don't have a bunch of people fighting and scratching and getting after their butts. And I know that's what I'll see. I know that's what I'll see when we watch the film. Let's do a game action together. Number one, the team that makes the field. Tennessee got the ball first and came out throwing. On the third play of the game, Alabama's defense made a statement. Willie Gaston intercepted this Heath Tuller pass, and Alabama's defense, one of the nation's best, made the first of several big plays. The teams exchanged punts, and Alabama got on the board first. Michael Proctor capped a 30-yard drive with his 22-yard field goal, 
and Bama led it 3 0. Tennessee's strategy was to throw the ball against the tide. After the field goal, Schuler spread the field and picked the Alabama defense apart with bullet passes. First to Corey Fleming. Then to Craig Faulkner. To try and stop Schuler, Alabama tried to blitz and Schuler column. Has the ball inside Alabama's 25, staying in the shotgun. Alabama brings everybody up on the line. Schuler sizes that up. Here comes the blitz. Here's Schuler to throw the ball deep down into the end zone. The pass is going to be touchdown. Big on. He felt the blitz. They came. He ripped the pass. And Faulkner makes the catch. And the Volunteers grab the lead by a score of 6-3. The touchdown pass vaulted Schuler past Andy Kelly for the single-season touchdown record at Tennessee. And more importantly, gave the Volunteers a 7-3 lead. This was a typical, hard-hitting, bone-jarring Tennessee-Alabama game. Tennessee's game plan was to shut down Alabama's running attack. The up-front quartet of Horace Morris, Shane Bonham, Paul Yatkowski, and James Wilson never let Alabama get started. Still leading 7-3, Tennessee was stung again by Alabama's defense. Tennessee lines up with a single running back. Moe Phillips behind Schuler, who fades to throw. Sets up, throws the ball across the middle. Man wide open. Max Pick has 45. Gets to the 50. Has the ball to the 45. It's hit. Fumbles the ball, and it's been recovered by Alabama at the 40-yard line. After Tennessee's second turnover, Alabama got a big play from Jay Barker. His pass to Kevin Lee covered 40 yards and moved the ball to the Tennessee 25. But the drive stalled, and Michael Proctor kicked his second field goal of the day. Alabama had cut into Tennessee's lead. It was now 7-6. to six. After the Alabama kickoff, Schuler was victimized one more time by Alabama's terrific cornerback, Antonio Langham. But one more time, the Tennessee defense didn't allow Alabama into the end zone. Bama was forced to settle for a field goal. The Tide led 9-7, but Tennessee had withstood three turnovers and still had not allowed a touchdown. This fact a key in the first half as Alabama led 9-7. To begin the second half, Alabama received the ball and Tennessee's defense made it a three play and out effort. Tennessee got the ball for the first time at its own 31. On the third play of the drive, a key moment in the game, as Heath Schuler, while running for a first down, was taken down hard and lands on his left shoulder. Schuler suffers a partially separated shoulder on the play, but he stays in the game. Schuler doesn't want Alabama to know he's hurt, but his ability to throw the ball is affected. After hitting 15 of 18 passes in the first half, Schuler misses three straight passes after the injury. Tennessee is forced to punt. Tennessee's defense had been great against the run all day. So the Tide tried to throw it, and Duran Jenkins made a big play. Barker dropping back to throw, looking for Palmer. There's the pass to Palmer downfield. Intercepted Tennessee at the 35. Back down to the 30. Gets to the outside, breaks a tackle, still with the ball. His interception put Tennessee in business at the Alabama 19. With Schuler hurting, Tennessee tried to run the football. When they couldn't do it, John Vexport came in and attempted to give Tennessee the lead. Holding will be Wheaton, snapping will be Holland. The kick by Vexport is in the air. The kick by Vexport is good. Tennessee leads by a score of 10 to 9. Alabama still had problems running against Tennessee's front wall. With Schuler struggling physically, Tennessee stayed on the ground, but still couldn't mount a threat. The third quarter ended with Tennessee leading 10 to 9. The crowd still hadn't gotten back from the concession stand when the fourth quarter started. Charlie Garner electrified Legion Field on the first play of the fourth quarter. And Schuler's got to check off again at the line as he sees the change in the defense. Alabama tightening up that defense as Schuler takes his time. 
Now he hands off and with the ball through the left side corner. Breaks one tackle, gets to the outside, 35-40, 45-50, 45-40, 35-30, 25-20, 15-10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Give him six. Touchdown, Big Orange! Tennessee's Charlie Garner on the checkoff races 73 yards. Got the clearing block finally from Billy Williams opening up the corridor and here goes Garner 73 yards to score and Tennessee leads 16 to 9. It was initially it was a pass play call and, and he's audible to it and, and once I heard the audible I, I just felt as though that you know if I made one good cut then I it, the possibility was there because um once Mario put his block on the linebacker I had to make the safety miss and then it was a foot race from there. The 73 yard run was the longest of the season and typified the slashing style of Charlie Garner. No, no, every, every time I touch the ball, I want to score a touchdown. And, and with that mentality, you'll never be pleased with a five-yard gain or a 10-yard gain because um, if you broke it for 10 yards, um, the possibility was there for you to take a 60. Tennessee led 17-9, but still 14-47 left to go on the game. Tennessee continued to make life miserable for Jay Barker. When he wasn't knocked down, he was hurried. He did get Alabama in position for a field goal with just over eight minutes to go, but Michael Proctor's kick sailed wide. Tennessee was still clinging to a 17-9 lead. But Tennessee had problems of its own. With Heath Schuler hurting, the passing attack was ground to a halt. The Alabama front stiffened, and the Tide was going to get the ball back with 4.18 left. Beginning at his own 23, Barker finally got the Alabama attack moving. Three oh nine left and Tennessee had the ball back. Tennessee needed just one first down. Just one first down to win the game. But Alabama would not allow it. Concerned about Schuler's throwing arm, Tennessee turned to Charlie Garner. But this time he couldn't get loose. Hutton was forced to punt and Alabama got it back at the 17. 83 yards away with no timeouts left. Alabama used the clock with no timeouts. Picking safe passes, Barker moved the team. Barker hit again to David Palmer. Four straight completions. The clock ticked, but not quickly enough for Tennessee. George Kidd slung Barker for a loss to force Alabama into a third and four situation. Alabama was faced with a fourth and 10 at the Tennessee 18. It took another big play. Alabama had turned in a pressure packed drive against Tennessee, but still found itself down by a point 17-16. Tennessee called timeout to set its defense, knowing Alabama would go for two. And Alabama went with its best player on student body right. The game was tied, but still Tennessee had 21 seconds left. Still time. On first and 10 at its own 20, Mose Phillips broke free right up the middle. But the play was called back on a crucial holding penalty. Tennessee tried Charlie Garner one more time, but there were no more long runs to be made on this day. Alabama had rallied in dramatic style. Tennessee had put it on the line, but on this day, wasn't able to come away with a victory. Well, I wish you could have been in the locker room and been able to film what we said after the game because I had a tremendous amount of respect for the effort and the, and the plan from the staff and the effort from the players uh, and, and the way we went about the Alabama game. I think it was a tremendous lift to our football team to know that we stood toe-to-toe -to -toe and really, really should have won the football game um, for the national champions, uh, defending national champions. And uh, I think it's a pace setter for what we expect here at Tennessee. Tennessee returned home on Halloween weekend to face the South Carolina Gamecocks. The Volunteers trying to shake off the effects of the Alabama game while still remembering Carolina upset Tennessee the year before in Columbia. It didn't take Tennessee long to seize control of this game 
On the second play from scrimmage, Tennessee exploded. Garner cuts left, breaks right. 45, 50, 45, gets to the outside, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 6, 60 yards. Charlie Garner starts right, cuts left, and the Volunteers are on the scoreboard. Charlie Garner, 60 yards, and Tennessee leads 6 to nothing. It took 49 seconds for Tennessee to get on the board and lead South Carolina 7-0. Using the strong running of Brandon Bennett, the Gamecocks marched right into Tennessee territory on their first possession. Again, the volunteer defense turned back the assault. South Carolina had to settle for a field goal, and the volunteers led it 7-3. After a Tennessee punt, the volunteers defense turned it up a notch. Reggie Ingram recovered a Brandon Bennett fumble, and Tennessee was in position to open up the lead again. Heath Schuler found Craig Faulkner for 22 yards to the Carolina 22. Another key play in the drive, Schuler finds Billy Williams to the one. It was then fourth and goal, and Tennessee didn't hesitate. There's a man in motion to the right. This is Stewart diving. Give it to him. Touchdown! Tennessee. Tennessee turned back another South Carolina drive on the Gamecocks' next position. Deron Jenkins comes up with the interception against Steve Tannehill. The quarter ends with Tennessee leading 14-3 and driving. On the first play of the second quarter, Tennessee struck again. Left side, as Schuler hands the ball off to the running back and grinding up the middle with Mose Phillips. He has the ball at the five. He has the ball at the four. He squints. He fights, he drives, he lowers his head, he scores for the Volunteers. Tennessee led it 21-3. Later in the second quarter, the Volunteers got the ball back and did it again. Schuler play action, looking deep, man wide open, should be six, is it? Yes! Touchdown, Corey Fleming! The three-play drive lasted only a minute and five seconds, and Tennessee led it 28-3. Other than the opening drive, which resulted in the field goal, South Carolina could not mount an attack against Tennessee. Steve Tannehill, who was so effective, mixing in the run in the pass the year before in Columbia, was running for his life in this game. The Carolina running attack was ineffective, and Tannehill didn't have time to throw the football. Tannehill can't find anybody open. When he... Now that you mention it, the pounding of Tannehill in South Carolina would have to be the highlight of the year. And then, really, to, to pay back South Carolina the way we did, um, you know, really silence Tannehill. I think that, that, was, that was a big thing. Meanwhile, Tennessee was now scoring on every possession. Down to the 45, 40, 35, 30, looking for a flag, none down, he's on his way. 25, 15, 10, 5, give him 6. James Stewart, 53 yards, touchdown, Big Orange. Tennessee led at halftime, 38 to 3, rolling up 364 yards in the first half. In the third quarter, the only scoring, a 23-yard field goal by John Bexport, and after three, Tennessee led it 41-3. In the fourth quarter, Coach Philip Formal was able to let some of his young players get some quality playing time. Sophomore quarterback Todd Helton directed the Volunteers to two scoring drives. The first, coming on a four-yard pass to his roommate, John Sartell. Helton's second touchdown came on a quick screen to Nilo Silva. And he did the rest. 25 yard line, breaking to the 40, to the 35, to the 30, to the 25, to the 29. Oh, Silva carries it into the end zone for a touchdown for the Volunteers. In the game, Tennessee had six scoring drives under two minutes. The longest scoring drive of the day took only three minutes and five seconds. Tennessee pounded South Carolina 55 to 3, and Tennessee was ready for the November stretch drive. Tennessee entered November facing the challenge of Howard Schnellenberger's 13th-ranked Louisville Cardinals. All week, the Cardinals had talked about this game. It was a chance to see how they stacked up against the top-10 team. And the Cardinals quickly found out that Tennessee was awfully tough. Louisville brought to town one of the nation's top senior quarterbacks in Jeff Brom. The Cardinals moved backwards on their first possession, starting at the 20, 
Louisville got a holding penalty, and then Tennessee was able to hold Louisville, and the Cardinals forced a punt. Tennessee's first possession began at the 41, and the Volunteers moved crisply down the field. Schuler hit Nilo Sylvan for a 15-yard gain, and then a roughing the passer penalty tacked on more. Charlie Garner helped move the ball deeper into Cardinal territory, and from the six, Schuler got the first score of the game on UT's first possession. Right to left, Schuler carries it back to the left side, and he fights his way square. Give him six. Touchdown, Pete Schuler. Nine plays and 58 yards, Tennessee in front, seven to nothing. The key in the game was to put pressure on Braun from the up front people. Tennessee had success doing this all season, and this game was no exception. Shane Bonham got to Braun and again forced Louisville to punt. The Volunteers got the ball back on their own 36 and proceeded to pound the Cardinal defense. Using quick passes to Billy Williams and Corey Fleming, combined with Charlie Garner's running, Tennessee moved into scoring position one more time. This is Schuler off play action, looking across the middle. Pass is, what a catch! Sensational catch! Unbelievable catch! Herculean catch! Craig Faulkner at the 10-yard line. It was a one-hander. And this time, a pass to Billy Williams took it to the one. From there, Charlie Garner took it in from the one. Tennessee had scored on its first two possessions and led 14 to nothing in the first quarter. Both teams scored field goals in the second quarter, and Tennessee went to the locker room leading Louisville 17 to three. Tennessee took the second half kickoff and put together its best drive of the day. Schuler hit four straight passes, two to Charlie Garner, as the Volunteers moved to the 40-yard line. And then Schuler found Faulkner over the middle for 18, as Tennessee moved into Louisville territory. Again, it was Schuler to Faulkner that put the ball at the 16. With a second and eight at the Louisville 14, Schuler and Fleming struck again. He leads 17 to three, marching with the football in Louisville territory. Schuler looks to throw across the middle, complete, gives him six. Corey Fleming! It was a record-breaking catch for Fleming. He surpassed Alvin Harper for the most TD passes in the season with nine. Later in the half, Tennessee was impressive again, grinding out a 12-play drive, 72 yards, and Tennessee opened up a 24-3 lead as the Volunteers and the Cardinals headed to the fourth quarter. Louisville came out throwing the ball. Brom found Ralph Dawkins for 28 yards to move the ball to the Tennessee two. From there, the Cardinals got their first touchdown of the day. Louisville had battled back to make it interesting at 24-10. Then to thicken the plot, Louisville went for the onside kick and got it. The Cardinals had a chance to get back in the game, and that's when Tennessee's defense stopped the threat. Brom with the snap. There's the man downfield. It is intercepted. Tennessee 20, 25, 30. He's sick, but holding on to the football is Deron Jenkins. Tennessee took over at the 29 and began another long march downfield. Charlie Garner and James Littleman Stewart combined to drive the ball right at Louisville. With the first and goal at the three, Tennessee got on the board again. Running backs are split for Schuler. Schuler, hands off, right side, knifing, spinning, driving, fighting, diving, scoring! James Stewart, Tennessee 30, Louisville 10. Then another big play for the Tennessee defense on Louisville's next possession. It was a game breaker as it turned out. It was a borderline call, but Jenkins was in the correct spot to pick it up and score as Tennessee led it 38 to 10. Tennessee's defense made sure Louisville didn't climb back into the game, stopping the Cardinals on their next possession. Senior James Wilson pressured Brom twice to force the Cardinals to punt. And then the Volunteers exploded. And here's the punt. Drills it. Fleming backs up, under the ball at his 30, looks for a block, now hands it off on a reverse. Tennessee has the ball with it. This is Tennessee to the 35 to the 40. This will be Nilo Silva to the 45-50, 45-40, 35-30, 25-20, 15-10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Give him six. Touchdown, Nilo Silva. 
Tennessee had turned back the 13th ranked Cardinals in impressive style, 45 to 10. The Volunteers now headed off to face their traditional rivals, Kentucky and Vanderbilt, to close out the season. The Tennessee Volunteers have been a dominant team in November. Since 1985, Tennessee has lost only one game in the month, and that was a last-minute thriller to Notre Dame in 1990. Tennessee was determined to make it another November to remember as the Volunteers headed north to Kentucky to play the Wildcats. Kentucky was already assured of heading to its first bowl game since 1984, but a win over Tennessee would send the Cats to the bowl game on a positive note. 1984 just happened to be the last time Kentucky had beaten Tennessee. On this cold November day in Commonwealth Stadium, Kentucky was no match for Heath Schuler and the Volunteers' explosive offense. Charlie Gardner was the main man on offense. He rolled to 186 yards rushing and was named as the SEC's most viable player. Through the air, Joey Kent emerged as another Tennessee threat. The redshirt freshman scored two touchdowns. Of his nine catches on the year to date, four had gone for touchdowns. The reliable Corey Fleming also had a big day. Two touchdowns, and in the process, had become the all-time leader in Tennessee touchdown receptions with 18. That was two better than the old mark held by Alvin Harper. On defense, it was another banner day. Paul Yetkowski led the way with this interception. Everybody played a part as the Volunteers kept the Kentucky eye bone out of the end zone. They controlled the Kentucky running attack, and they smothered the Wildcats all day. In fact, one of the hardest hits Kentucky had all day was on Tennessee head coach Philip Fulmer, and it was out of bounds. The beer barrels stayed in Tennessee. The Volunteers blasted Kentucky 48 to nothing and headed for the season finale against Vanderbilt. The Vanderbilt game was the finale for 16 Tennessee seniors. As per tradition, on the final practice of the regular season, this year on Thanksgiving, Coach Philip Fulmer introduced each senior, and they got a chance to take a free wallop on a tackling dummy dressed up in a Vanderbilt uniform. The seniors determined to go out in style against the Commodores. These seniors had never lost to Vanderbilt. Tennessee started slowly on this cold and damp day at Neyland Stadium. The Volunteers' first two possessions resulted in turnovers. It was a scoreless game when the Volunteers finally got on track. Summers chases up, makes the catch at midfield, fakes the handoff, has the ball 45-40, 35-30, 25-20, 15-10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Give him six. Touchdown, Sean Summers! Then big plays dominated. Tennessee turned Vanderbilt turnovers into quick touchdowns. It was a day of thrilling plays, exciting touchdowns, and a great way to send 16 Tennessee seniors out in style with a dominating 62-14 win over the Commodores. Tennessee with the ball. Schuler back to throw on first down. Here's the pass across the middle. It is... Oh, no. Oh, no. That was even more miraculous than the catch before. Craig Faulkner. He volleyballed that ball. He tipped it in midair twice and then pulled it down. It's complete for 22, but that, ladies and gentlemen, is something I have never seen before. <laughs> Here's running to the left side. Five, four, three, two, one. Give him six. Touchdown, James Stewart. This will be Gordon across the middle, pass intercepted by Jason Park. Schuler off play action, looking to throw, going deep down into the end zone. Fighting for the ball, making the catch to the four. Three, two, one, touchdown, Joey Kent! 
right back behind Schuler Gibbs to Garner. Starts right, cuts left. Has the ball 15, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. What else? Touchdown penalty. Pitch will go to the tailback. Slanting through the right side of the line is Scott, and he pitches. He fumbles the football. There's a scramble for it at the 44-yard line. It has been recovered by the big on it. At the Vanderbilt 12, handoff goes to the tailback, and Stewart is hit, but he breaks the tackle at the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. What a run! Touchdown, James Stewart! As Colquitt starts to the left, gives to Stewart, tries the corner, cuts inside, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Touchdown, James Stewart! Melton back to throw, hands off on a reverse, and Vanderbilt's waiting on it, but then the man who got the reverse breaks free, has the ball to the outside, to the 35, to the 40, to the 45, to the 50, to the 45, to the 40, to the 35, to the 30, to the 25, to the 20, 15, 10, 5, all the way, Nilo Sylvan, 64 yards, touchdown, Tennessee! 1993 will be remembered as a season when Tennessee continued its New Year's Day tradition of playing in a bowl game. The Volunteers accepted a bid to play Penn State in the Citrus Bowl in Orlando. While Tennessee didn't win them all, finishing 9-1-1, the effort was there, and the team continued to get better all season long. At the end of the season, Tennessee finished fifth in the nation in the polls, and most of the voters agreed the Volunteers were playing some of the best football in the country. The Volunteers were explosive all season. Tennessee scored 62 touchdowns, an SEC record. The Volunteers also set a record for most points in a season. John Bexport continued his string of consecutive extra points, now at 122 straight. And Bexport also earned All-American honors. He missed only one field goal attempt all season long. The defense had two shutouts and led the SEC in quarterback sacks. Pete Schuler was the leading passer in the SEC. He had 25 touchdown passes, the most in the conference. Tennessee, with its stable of terrific running backs, led the SEC in rushing. And Sean Summers led the conference in punt returns. There were plenty of positives to reflect back on during the year of 1993, and with a bright, big orange future ahead for the Volunteers, Tennessee indeed was tearing up the turf in 1993.